Whether you're a business owner or a Pinterest manager wanting to get results, traffic, and profit on Pinterest in 2024 and beyond, then you need to watch this YouTube episode. I'm Emily Bales. I'm a Pinterest marketing expert and coach, and for the past almost five years now, help my students and my clients increase their traffic and turn it into profit through the power of Pinterest marketing. So in this episode, I am going to break down how to create scroll stopping pins on Pinterest. So before we dive into the exact elements you need to have in these pins you're creating for the platform, I wanna explain why creating scroll stopping pins is so important on Pinterest. So for starters, Pinterest is a visual search engine. So you can categorize Pinterest along the lines of YouTube and Google, because it is a search engine. So when people come to the platform, they come with a problem and they're actively going up to the search bar, typing in keywords so that they can find a solution to that problem. So it's actually quite unique from social media. Now, of course, social media is a great way for businesses obviously to monetize. However, Pinterest does serve this very unique purpose. So what makes Pinterest so unique is the visual part. So like I mentioned, it is a search engine, but it has this visual piece that really captivates people in a different and a unique way. But that's also why it's so important to create these scroll stopping pins, because the visual piece is such a huge part of your success ultimately on the platform. So going back to the way that Pinterest functions, the first thing I really focus on for my clients is doing in-depth keyword research because that is the first action typically that users are taking on the platform. They're going up to the search bar and typing in those keywords. So I do have multiple YouTube episodes all about how to do keyword research for your business. So if you would like to check out those other episodes, I will link that. Now, let's get back to how to create these scroll stopping pins. So once people hit enter on that search, the next part of what I really like to call the Pinterest funnel, keywords, now we're moving on to images. So the next thing that the users are seeing come up are pins. So the user starts scrolling or the pinner and they're trying to decide what is offering the perfect solution to their problem. Now, of course, they might become inspired and interested in multiple different pins, which is nice because Pinterest does allow the Pinterest user to save pins. So the pinner can save a pin for later. They can click on the pin. If they're really wanting to learn more, then they will actually leave Pinterest and go to the website. And that's another reason why Pinterest is so powerful for business owners. On social media, we're really trained to stay on the platform, continue to scroll, continue to consume content. Whereas Pinterest, it's a traffic driver. It's driving traffic off the platform. And pinners are used to that concept of, okay, I see this, I wanna learn more, I'm gonna leave Pinterest. So that makes it so powerful for business owners because you can drive traffic to your products, your offers, your lead magnets. That's why I also think that every business owner should be capitalizing on Pinterest. Okay, so now I am going to essentially give you a quick breakdown checklist of what I want you to be including in your pins in order to create scroll stopping pins. And then we're gonna dive over, we're gonna take a peek at my Pinterest account and also the process I go through when I'm designing pins for myself and also my clients. But first, let's go ahead and dive into this checklist, so to put it. So the first thing you need to do is make sure that you have formatted your pins correctly. So if you were to look on Pinterest, they recommend formatting your pins 1000 by 1500 pixels. So that is the safest format to make sure that you are not having your pins cut off. And also too, I have seen square pins or pins that look really small when you see them come up in the Pinterest feed and it kind of throws you off a little bit. You just know that they're not what you typically see. And I find that people are less likely to click them. It's not following Pinterest recommendations and best practices for designing pins. So if you wanna be on the safe side, format your pins 1000 by 1500 pixels or a two to three ratio. But like I said, on Pinterest, they actually say 1000 by 1500. Now, I've actually tested this for my clients in the past and I've had students ask me about this, making their pins extra long. 
And the thought process behind making pins a bit longer than that two to three ratio is because it does take up a little bit more real estate, meaning that when you see a longer pin in the feed, it kind of sticks out because it takes up more space. However, that's not exactly what Pinterest recommends in terms of best practices. And they actually specifically mention that if your pins are too long, then they'll be truncated or essentially cut off at the bottom. So I have tested longer pins and I did not see that they were cut off. However, I didn't see that they really performed any better than the pins that were formatted correctly. So I just stuck to the two to three ratio. Plus it's one thing if I'm testing that on my account, but, and like I mentioned, I did test it on one of my clients because she had actually created some longer pins in the past and she wanted to continue to test them. But I really tried to obviously follow best practices for my clients. I teach my students the same thing. So I do have a Pinterest manager academy where I'm training people how to become Pinterest managers so they, they can offer that service. And I always teach them first and foremost to follow best practices. And it is a best practice to just format them correctly. So moving on, let's say that you have the dimensions down pat. The next thing you need to do is have branding for your pins. So whether you are marketing your own business on Pinterest, you're managing somebody else's account on Pinterest, it's a great thing to have either your logo, your website, and also colors, fonts, all of those come to play with branding, right? So for hex codes, I have my unique colors for my brand. I'll also put emilyvales.com on my pins. Sometimes I do use a logo, but depending the way it looks on pins, I always like to have my website just because it's linear at the bottom, looks clean. Sometimes, especially with my clients, depending on how, what their logo looks like, I just prefer having the website, but once again, you can always play around with it if you wanna have the logo on there, but I do recommend having some type of branding. So when you're thinking about that branding as well, and depending on fonts, whether once again, you're marketing your business or your clients on Pinterest, you have to take into consideration with fonts, a lot of businesses will have multiple different fonts. And for me, I have one that is more like calligraphy or a little bit more fancy. And then my, another sub font I have is a bit more straight, clear. And then my last font is very simplistic. It's open sans, classic font, very easy to read. So when you're thinking about these fonts, one thing I want you to keep in mind is that a lot of pinners, I believe it's as high as 85, 87% are looking at Pinterest on their mobile device. So that means what you're seeing on your desktop when you're designing pins is going to be much smaller when the Pinterest user is looking on their mobile device. So take that into consideration with the fonts because if you're using a very script type font, it's honestly, it's hard to read. And when we confuse people, we lose them. So if something has the script font, it's having, it's hard to read, people just subconsciously will continue to scroll. It's not catching their attention. It, it becomes a little bit muddled. So I recommend having large, clear, easy to read font. And if you are going to use some script font for an accent, it can create a visually nice looking pin, <laughs> but it's, you have to do it well. So what I mean by doing it well, if you're going to use script font, it's important to use the script font on words that would not be keywords that you want to rank for. Just think of to, the, in the, some of those words, maybe even how to, but not the pillar keywords. So for an example, a lot of my content obviously surrounds Pinterest marketing. So if the keyword I want to rank for on the pin I'm creating is Pinterest traffic, I would not write Pinterest traffic in that script font. I want that font to be super clear, easy to read with the keywords that I wanna rank for. So like I said, think of some of the lesser important words on the pen and you could use some script there. So that's just something to keep in mind. I know depending on niches too, some niches really love script font and I think it's okay if you want to do a little bit of testing, but just to keep in mind that you do wanna make sure that those keywords that you wanna rank for are very easy to read. So, so far we've talked about dimensions, branding. Now I want to talk about obviously a huge part of your pin 
is the image. Of course, the image is going to be the focal point. So I recommend having bright, clear, crisp photos. And of course, they have to be cohesive with what your text overlay says. So with mine being about Pinterest marketing, I'm thinking about, okay, how can my picture relate to the keywords? You need to have that cohesiveness or it just feels kind of random, right? So it's really important that that image is not only high quality, but that it does go along with the text that you have on that pen. Now I do want to mention something as we're talking about pen design, there are some niches that don't really use a lot of any text overlay. And I think that that's something that's important to pay attention to. I've noticed specifically within photography that a lot of pins won't have text overlay, but then you'll see some that will have text overlay. So in this case, you could test both. If you wanted to test some pins without text overlay, by all means. I've also noticed that within style and fashion that a lot of times you'll just see a really well put together outfit and you don't always see text overlay on the pin. That's okay, you can always test that. But I would test both pin designs with text overlay, pins without. But once again, making sure that that image is really great and high quality. I also want to mention when you're thinking about selecting the image, once it, like I said, you want to make sure that the picture <laughs> correlates with the text overlay on the pin. But I also really want to encourage you to branch off of just using stock images. I know that some brands don't have, or some businesses don't have a lot of their own lifestyle or essentially staged images of their product. But I do think whether it's your business or you're marketing on Pinterest for somebody else to encourage them to have some of their own images. I find with my clients that if they have their own products staged, if they are in the images, you can just tell and feel when pictures are unique to that brand. And I think it comes across differently. Now that's not to say that you can't utilize stock photos. And some of my clients have even had subscriptions to platforms that you can continue to get access to really great stock photos. But it's just important to keep in mind if you have brand images that those are really great to showcase whatever it is that you're offering to your audience. So I know that especially with food bloggers on Pinterest, they have to really be super intentional about their images because that's a huge way that they are capturing their audience. So the whole point of this video being images and capturing your audience in Pinterest is so unique because people just get inspired in a different way with that visual aspect. So I just really want to encourage to always be testing. And also when we're thinking about stock photos, I do want to mention that if you're using a platform where maybe you don't have a subscription or a membership, honestly, Canva, I have been an affiliate for Canva. I love Canva. That's where I design all of my pins. However, one thing to keep in mind, even with Canva, whether you have the paid version or the pro version, you are essentially getting access to stock photos that everybody else who's using Canva has access to. So when you're thinking about that, if you have seen a stock photo used again and again and again, you probably wanna avoid using that stock photo. So I have worked with a lot of educators over the years and there were certain images, whether they be in the classroom or working with students, where I felt like I had seen that same image used again and again. So that would definitely be a red flag. Do not use that image. So that's once again, a reason why it's nice to have your own unique photos. Okay, so we have talked about dimensions. We have talked about branding. We've talked about high quality photos. The next thing I want to hit on is making sure that you have a call to action on your pins. So a call to action is essentially telling Pinterest users what you want them to do next, or even essentially relaying to them what they can expect to receive if they click through on your pin. Now I've had students ask me, do I have to use a call to action on every single pin? Of course, there's no rules that you have to, but I do think that you should test it on a portion of your pins to see how they perform. And I've noticed that some business owners don't always even think about it, so they don't have them at all. So at least create some of your pins to see how they perform. And always keep in mind, if you decide to split test and you're like, okay, Emily, I'm gonna listen to you. You create some pins 
with a call to action, some without, to really understand the difference between those pins and how they're performing, you're gonna to wanna to give it some time. So not a couple of weeks, not even 30 days, I would say 60 to 90 days to see if those pins are performing better than other pins and really doing that A-B split test. So when you're thinking about that call to action though, you're probably wondering, okay, what could this look like on my pins? So depending on where my pin is being directed to, I will translate that in the call to action. So if I am directing a pin to one of my lead magnets, let's say I have a free Pinterest manager training. It is a live training and it is a really important piece of my funnel and building my email list is getting people to watch that free training. So I'll put on the pin, click here to watch the free training. Or if I have a lead magnet, I might say, download the free PDF. If I have a blog post, I might put learn more, get the tips here. So you can kind of see where I'm going with that as far as giving people that call to action and telling them what to do next. Now, if you have a product that it's leading to, you could test buy now get access here. There's different ways that you can play with that, but I do think it's good to have some really direct things you're telling your audience and telling them exactly what to expect when they click through. And then that also helps people understand what's coming next and hopefully will decrease some bounces and, you know, actually having people click through and then take that next step with your business. Okay, and then last but not least, when we are talking about designing scroll stopping pins, I want you to think about creating the most juicy hooks for your pins. Now, of course, we talked about not always using text overlay, but if you are using text overlay, I want you to think about writing titles or text overlay on your pin that make people feel like, ooh, this is so good, I have to learn more. So when you're thinking about that, I notice and a lot of pins that are high ranking when I'm doing searches, a lot of them will have numbers, like five ways to how to get the steps here. But you really wanna think about what else makes people want to click through. And sometimes people will even be using these words when they're searching. So for example, I know the other morning my girls wanted pancakes, so I put the best ever pancakes that could be something that you were writing on the text overlay. So when you are writing that text overlay, don't make it bland or generic, but what would you wanna read or what would capture you and make you feel like you had to click through? And speaking of clicking through, one thing that I have to mention when we are talking about pin design, and this isn't so related to hooks, <laughs> so kind of moving on here with hooks, but I want to talk about pins that are essentially infographs or are giving all of the information or a majority of the information right there on the pin. There are pins that I see that perform very well that are super informative and it might lead one to feel like I don't even necessarily need to click through. It's giving me all the information here. Sometimes they have steps, sometimes they have bullets, it can be done a variety of ways. Sometimes it'll even be images, but I want you to think about if you were creating the, these type of infograph pins that you might get a lot of saves, but you might not get as many people clicking through and be increasing those outbound clicks. And ultimately we want people to click through to our website because that's how we're gonna get traffic and that's how we convert traffic into sales. So I do wanna mention that you can test these types of pins and they might get a lot of saves and that can be helpful because saves are a really important metric in the eyes of the Pinterest algorithm. And if you wanna learn more about Pinterest analytics and what metrics you should be paying attention to, I will link that in this YouTube episode because I do have a full episode all about that. But I do wanna mention that you can absolutely be testing these informational type pins and they can be really helpful and they might get you a lot of saves, but just keep in mind that you might not get very much traffic from them. So I wanna make a large portion of your pin designs that informational. So you can test it, but like I said, still have a lot where you are essentially getting the person to leave Pinterest and drive that traffic. So I did share with you that I wanted to give you a quick overview of what this looks like in practice for my business. So we are going to jump over. We're gonna take a quick peek at my Pinterest account, also Canva, and then we're gonna wrap up this episode. Okay, so here we are inside my Pinterest account, and I wanted to show you a few 
things I was referencing in this episode because I think that when you can see what I'm talking about, that it makes it a lot more impactful. So I actually just logged into my Pinterest account. This was my home feed and a few things I wanted to point out popped up right away. So this first pin that's in black that says 57 epic side jobs for extra money, 10K a month. This pin I can tell right away just by looking at it. It's not a two to three ratio. I can tell it is extra long. And that's not a huge issue. It does stick out. It does take up more real estate, like I mentioned. However, I can't see at the bottom that the name or the website, the logo, whatever that may be, it is cut off. So you can see here, Harm Folks, whatever that brand is, I can't really see it exactly when it's shown in the feed, which it's not a huge issue, but it does cut it off a little bit. Also why <laughs> Pinterest tells us to create 1,000 to 1,500 pixel uh, pin dimensions. This baby list one, that does appear to be correctly formatted. This pin here, the 20 part-time second jobs that make $5,000 monthly. I can tell this one once again that that one is extra long. You know what's interesting is that they actually have their website along the side. I wonder if they knew that part of the bottom might actually be cut off. So like I said, if you wanna test it, test it. This pin right here, the one that I'm hovering over that says Tile Club, that pin appears to be square. There's one down here that is a bit more rectangular shaped. They are smaller. I think that if I were going to err on one side of not completely formatting my pins, it would be a pin that was extra long and, you know, takes up more space. Whereas these pins, they're not very impactful. They just don't stick out to me. And what happens sometimes is that the business owner didn't even create that pin and somebody has actually pinned an image from their website. And when they do that, it's not always formatted correctly. So that could be the case. Or occasionally people don't always realize that if you pin something directly from Instagram. So if you click on Instagram, some of your images, you can actually share them directly to other platforms. That does not mean it's optimized for that platform just because you can share it directly. So for example, on Instagram, if you were to share an image to Pinterest, it would not be formatted correctly. And it does kind of stick out, but not necessarily in a good way. You can see that it's not the right size, but a lot of times it doesn't have the text overlay doesn't pop. It's just a different strategy on Pinterest and that's okay, but also why you need to create pins unique for the platform. Now, sometimes I have taken something from another platform and resized it using Canva, which is a tool that's really helpful, but it is important to have that mindset where you're, if you're using text overlay, you're including keywords and it's just a lot different platform to platform. So you always want to make sure that you are optimizing for the specific platform that you're creating for. Otherwise that content's just going to kind of fall flat. You can also see, I've noticed this with nails. That's one of my favorite things to search on Pinterest that a lot of them do not have text overlay. Remember, like I said, here's one that's fashion test without text overlay. If, especially for your niche, you think it would perform well without text overlay. You can see here, this is obviously showcasing a digital product. Not all pins. Also, this is something I want to point out. Not all pins always have an image either. So there's definitely different things you can test and play with. You could always test having pins that don't have an image. So this boy names for girls <laughs> that doesn't have an image and that's okay. It also is offering the information that the person wants right there on the pin. So this is kind of like what I was talking about with an infograph, which obviously this isn't an infograph, but it is a list. And typically what people would be clicking through to, to get that ultimate list, they're being given right here. However, maybe Pax, Lennon, Hartley, Tatum, Marlo, Hudson, Winter, maybe you love those names and you wanna save this pin for later. Once again, you can see why somebody would wanna save the pin, but it doesn't seem as attractive to click through when you're given the information right there. So that was another really great example. Once again, even with this Italy travel bucket list, it's giving you the bucket list, the, the checklist right here on the pin, but you could see why somebody wanna save that for later. So it's really great to test those pins because they can perform really well. It can build saves. And I don't wanna to get too deep into metrics because like I mentioned, I do have another YouTube episode about Pinterest analytics, what metrics you should be tracking, what they mean, how they're important, but saves are important. And it tells the Pinterest algorithm that this person is creating really great high quality content that's inspiring 
to their audience, we should show more of their content. So do keep that in mind. I love this pin right here. I can tell that's longer, the most unique baby shower ideas for girls. I wanna to mention too, remember how I said that if you're gonna use script or fancy font to make sure that it's not the most important words on the pin. This one has ideas. It's a little bit of a fun font. It adds uniqueness to it. It's pretty, it's cute, but it's still very easy to read the main concept of the pin, baby shower ideas. So I wanted to point that out. I think that's super helpful. When you are thinking about pins, I do like collages sometimes. I noticed one up here that I thought was really great, the uh, must-haves while traveling. I think, you know, I definitely understand the desire to want to click through. I like this one too, eight must-see ways to organize makeup. That makes me want to click through. Remember how we were talking about a hook? That makes people feel like, ooh, I need to learn more, especially if you're into makeup. That can be really helpful. It can be hard to organize makeup. I think that's really great example of a powerful hook. This pin right here, the only thing, and I love, love, love the different items that are being shown. I will say on my desktop, because I'm on my desktop, it's pretty small. So one thing I would take, I would take into consideration is that when it's on your phone, it's gonna be even smaller. And maybe this pen performed well for this person, but I did wanna mention that just because that pops out to me that it's very small. So that's just something to keep in mind if you do go for more of a collage type format. So now that we've taken a look at a few different things that I mentioned, I want to hop over really quickly to Canva. This is where I design all of my pins. There are other ways to design pins. Actually, Tailwind has a create feature where they will, and I'm, I'm not gonna get into that in this episode, I am happy to. Let me know in the comments if you want me to get into it. But Tailwind has this feature where they're essentially creating the pins for you. I do like to create my pins. I work from templates. I'm always adding to the templates though so that I keep things fresh and fun. But it's so nice because you can just type in Pinterest pin and you'll see video pins, um, carousel ad. It gives you, and then you can even see that it's already correctly formatted so I can click on Pinterest pin. A lot of times I'm starting from a blank canvas. And what I like to do when I am creating templates, never, never copy, of course, but I do like to see what are similarities that top ranking pins for a specific niche have in common? How can I use that to inspire my pins? Like I said, I don't ever recommend copying, of course not, but it's okay to look at other things and say, Oh, I'm noticing that they always have text at the top of the pin or there's only images. Maybe I don't even need text overlay. So just a few different things to keep in mind. Let's go with the search that I actually just did because I'm seeing it come up. Easy homemade wheat bread. I want to start making homemade bread. So, <laughs> P.S. Send me all of your um, sourdough bread making, whatever tips my way. Um, okay, so these are the pins that I'm seeing. Right off the bat, actually, Pinterest recommends, I believe, having the text at the top of the pin. These pins have the text in the middle. Huh, maybe I want to test a pin where the text is in the middle. Like I said, I'm paying attention to similarities. So does that mean I have to copy these pins exactly? No, of course not. But that might be a good thing to test within your pin templates. So easy, homemade whole wheat bread, best ever, no need. So you can see some of those things too that are kind of hooking people in. The no need captures my attention because I don't like to need the bread for some reason. Uh, it, I like have to take my rings off and then I'm scared I'm gonna lose my rings. I, it's silly, I know I should probably just use my um, standing mixer, but then my standing mixer is stored. It's, I know, I know, it's a lot of laziness. So <laughs> back to this, actually as I scroll, I'm still seeing a lot of pins with the text in the middle, which is super interesting. Um, I love the easy no fail because I have messed up recipes with yeast, something interesting to keep in mind. So, ooh, I really like this one where it doesn't have a background. It's just, you can tell it's right over the top of the image, but it says whole wheat, no need bread. Very simple. I've noticed a lot of these are pretty simple. They're letting the pictures speak for themselves, but also capturing pain points. People want something that's easy. They're not gonna mess up, still tastes yummy. Think of those things when you're creating your pins. What are pain points of your audience? So then I'm gonna come over here and I could start. Now, if it's hard for you to start from scratch, 
then you can start with a template, but everybody else who's using Canva also has access to these pin templates. So that's just something else to keep in mind. So maybe let's say, now, if you are a food blogger, you probably have your own pictures, but for all intents and purposes, I <laughs> don't. So maybe I have one, let's say I take these pictures, they're stock photos. I take one image. I do really like this one. It looks yummy. Like I said, food bloggers are probably using their own images, but we'll just use this for today's example. I'm going to scroll, see maybe the other one is kind of the process here with the image. I also noticed that the images were fit to the pin. Move this over a little bit. Okay. So then I could put my text right in the middle. I'm going to make that larger. I really enjoy looking at pins that it's super clear, easy to read what I'm going to be receiving when I click through the easiest. I was looking up sourdough recipes the other day. So like I mentioned, one thing I noticed was that the pin designs that I was looking at, they were very simple. I don't think you have to be crazy. Easy to read, clear. See how long that took me? Just a couple of minutes. And I was actually being kind of pokey because this was totally on a whim, but you don't have to go crazy. And then down here at the bottom, you could just add your website. So it doesn't, and then you have this template and of course you can change different things about it, but I love using Canva. It's super easy to use. You can then, um, you can always resize it. You can duplicate them, uh, duplicate page, whatever, easy peasy. So that's, I love using Canva. This is where I'm designing my pins. And maybe not, like I mentioned in another episode, I will show how to use Tailwind Create because I have played around with that. And I do think once again, if you can't see a theme here, I do like to test. And so I have tested some pins in Tailwind Create. So what we're gonna do now, we are actually going to wrap up this episode. I hope today's episode gave you tons of ideas and inspiration when you are designing your pins on Pinterest. I just wanna invite you to let me know in the comments what other questions you have, or even share different topics or things that you would like me to cover in upcoming episodes. Episodes. And if I already have an episode over whatever topic you're asking about, I am happy to share the link for that. It would mean so much to me if you would like this episode and subscribe to my YouTube channel. That allows me to create content, continue to come back and serve you. And I would be so grateful. So like I said, I can't wait to see you soon in next week's episode. Bye for now.